Well, good morning. It's good to be here this morning. My name's Steve Harley. I'm our Taze Valley Campus pastor. And uh, if you were here last week, you know we started a new series on the book of Revelation. And it's really kind of a, a two-part series. It's going to be pretty lengthy. The first part of the series, it, we're, we're calling When Jesus Comes to Church. And we're going to be looking at the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. And then we're going to continue it on by calling the second part, When the Church Comes to Jesus, as we walk our way through the rest of the book. Last week, we introduced you to the book of Revelation and started, sort of uh, walked through the first chapter of Revelation. We talked about how we need to be ready for the return of Christ. Uh, it talks about the time is near in Revelation 1. And so we talked about how we need to be ready because none of us know when Christ will return. Even, even though there are some people who claim they know, uh, they will get all wrapped up in the symbolism of Revelation, and so they start thinking they can know the exact time and date and things like that. Uh, this cracked me up this week. Jeff Ranson came up to me, and he was telling me a story. Uh, he was telling me about his small group that met on Wednesday. And uh, a member of his small group was saying, this happened to her just this week. Uh, she was working at a medical clinic, and she was uh, trying to get appointments ready for somebody, and, and she asked this guy, this patient, she said, uh, how about September 11th? Can you come in then? And, and no joke, he seriously said, oh, no, I can't do that. That's when Christ is returning. <laughs> and then this is my favorite part. <laughs> she goes, okay, well, uh, how about September 14th? He's like, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> so, <laughs> the true story, I, I cried laughing when he told me that. So apparently he's just a spectator when Christ returns, I don't know. Now I realize that the study of Revelation can be somewhat intimidating. Uh, but there's a reason that, that, that Revelation can be somewhat complex. Uh, the Apostle John, who's writing this down, is getting a, a glimpse, a, a vision, into some things that no one has ever seen before. He's, he's seeing creatures and things that no human eye has seen, yet he's trying to put it into human terms, what he's seeing. I, I kind of compare it to this. Let's imagine that you take a trip to Disney World, and you've, you see all the sights, and you ride all the rides, and you, you know, participate in everything there. And after your trip now, you take another trip to a third world country, let's say in Africa somewhere, where they have no TV, no internet, no connection to the outside world, and now you try and describe to them what you have seen and heard at Disney World. You'd be like, well, we were on these uh, roller coasters, and well, you don't know what a roller coaster is. It's like these uh, little cars that are on a, no, you don't know what a car is. How am I going to say this? And so it gets a little hard, right? You start saying, well, I, uh, I saw this, you know, Mickey Mouse. You don't know who Mickey Mouse is, but it's this giant talking mouse. Yeah, that sounds really weird, doesn't it? So it'd be very difficult for you to put into terms to make them understand. And this is kind of what's happening here. There are some things that, that are talked about in the book of Revelation, and we can know them for sure because, you know, it's, they'll, they'll sometimes clarify what these symbols are. But other times, it's an analogy that the people living in that time would, would definitely understand, and so we kind of got to get, get the context of what's going on. And, and then, yet there are other times where it's just, it's just hard for us to understand, and I don't know if we'll ever understand until we reach heaven. You know, I, I, the, ancient, the, the ancient Christians had a term for people who believed that they knew everything about the book of Revelation, and it was called liar, right? You don't, you don't know, and I don't know. And so I'm not going to stand up here arrogantly saying that I have all the answers to what's going on in this book, but that shouldn't prevent us from taking a good look at this book of the Bible, because as we read last week in Revelation 1, 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written, because the time is near. There's a lot we can gain from this. Now, in Revelation, the Apostle John is writing to real churches who are experiencing real crisis because the Roman government is, is demanding their allegiance, and some of their demands are really going against what God would want them to do. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Revelation chapter 2. It's the last book of the Bible. And in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we're going to clearly see that there are different churches who are choosing different ways to handle these challenges that are presented before them. Some were sold out to Christ, and others were selling out Christ. And so Jesus 
will, in this section of scripture, is going to send a message to seven different churches in Asia Minor. And he's going to talk specifically to each and every one of them. Now, obviously, there are more than seven churches in Asia Minor at that time. But if you remember from last week, that number seven is very symbolic in the book of Revelation. Seven has significance. It represents completion or fulfillment. So these seven churches that Jesus chose are representative of all of the churches then and all of the churches to come. In these letters to the seven churches, we're going to see kind of a running theme, a a pattern that you'll see throughout each of the letters. And and we know them by three C's. The first is there's going to be a commendation. He's going to say what this church is doing right. The second C is condemnation. He's going to say, hey, this is what's going on in your church that's going wrong. And then the third C is correction. This is what you need to do to get things right. And we're going to see this pattern seven times as he writes these seven letters. Today, we're going to look at two of the letters to two of the churches. We're going to be looking at the first letter to the church in a city called Ephesus in chapter 2. And then we're going to skip over to the last one in, at the end of Revelation 3. And it's a letter to a church at a city called Laodicea. And the reason we're not doing them in order, one right after the other, is because we're grouping them by theme, by similarity. Today's theme is we're talking about the heart of the church the heart of the church. And there was a heart issue with these churches in Ephesus and Laodicea. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to give you three phrases to kind of latch on to as we're reading through these letters. And the first phrase is this. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, we take a lot of stock in our identity. So that's kind of weird to hear. It doesn't make sense at first. But let me explain the context of this. The the churches that we're going to be looking at today seem to struggle with pride and arrogance. They were into themselves and their appearances and their abilities. Their egos were puffed up. Kind of reminds me of the story of a guy named Christian Herter. Christian Herter was uh, governor of Massachusetts and he was running for a second term in office. And one day he was out chasing votes and everything and and, uh, working hard. And he arrived at a church barbecue real late in the afternoon. And, And by this time he was just famished. And so as Herter moved through the line, uh, the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving the chicken. And she put a piece of chicken on the plate, and then she turned to the next person in line. Excuse me, he said, uh, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? And the woman said, sorry, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. Well, Governor Herter, he was was a, a, a very modest and unassuming man. But he decided after he'd kind of tried again with her to, to, to throw a little weight around. He said, ma'am, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. And the woman said, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. <laughs> and so we're going to see that pride in your past accomplishments or arrogance about who you think you are or, or, or what you think you have done, it doesn't get you very far with Jesus. Maybe you heard about the student who had entered college. He was a freshman going off to college and entered, uh, you know, welcome weekend and went through all the orientation stuff. And at the end of all the orientation, there was a reception. And so he started talking to this lady who was kind of standing there all alone. And she asked him, you know, how his experience at college had been so far. And he said, I love it. I love the intramural sports that I've signed up for. I love the people that are in my dorm. I'm having a great time. He said, the only complaint I have is the president of the university. She kind of gasped. She's like, whoa, 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 what, what's wrong with the president? What do you mean? And he said, well, this guy, this president, he's so out of touch. He doesn't know what's going on. I, I really just don't think he's fit to lead this college. And the woman said, young man, do you know who I am? I'm the wife of the president. The young man said, well, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, good. And then he ran off. <laughs> We, we tend to think of our identity, or, or in this case, our lack of identity, that, that our identity will save us. It'll preserve us. And the Ephesians church, they were very much into their identity and who they were, who they had been. The Ephesian church was a strong church. It had a rich history with some of the greatest leaders in church history. It had been a thriving church for many, many years and still was by the time the book of Revelation was written. So let's read this book, uh, this letter written in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, 
Now that's how each of these letters are going to start. And if you'll notice, if you're looking in your Bible, it's in red letters here. Jesus is the one talking in this section of Scripture. And we haven't seen Jesus really talking since all the way back in Acts chapter 1, right before he ascended into heaven. But here he's talking, and he's speaking to John once again, and John is writing down Jesus' words. And so let's see what Jesus tells John to write down to give to this church in Ephesus. He says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now you'll notice, if you read chapter 1 last week, that the imagery is starting to get stronger. And it continues to get stronger as we read through this book. In chapter 1, it says that Jesus has the seven stars. Here in chapter 2, it says he holds the seven stars in his right hand. It's like he's in total control. In the first chapter, Jesus is standing in the midst of the lampstands, which we know those represent the churches. But in chapter 2, it says he's moving about throughout. He's walking among the golden lampstands. And what does this mean? It means that he's inspecting the faithfulness of the churches, measuring their integrity. It means that he's actively involved, just as he should be actively involved in our church today. So Jesus is going to have some words for this church in the city of Ephesus. But I, I think to understand what he says to this church, we need to understand a little bit of the background of the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus at this time was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. At this time, it was about 220,000 people, which is about the same size as St. Albans, right? Pretty, pretty close. Not quite. Big city, especially in that time. Ephesus was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It was very wealthy, and it boasted one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the great temple to Artemis, also known as Diana. This temple of Artemis to Artemis was, was enormous. And it housed a statue of Artemis that was considered to be one of the most sacred images in the ancient world. Not only were there these, was there this temple to Artemis, but they had built temples to other Roman emperors like Claudius and Nero. You may have heard of Nero. He's the one who had Paul executed Ephesus also was, was situated in a great place. It had the greatest harbor in Asia Minor, and many roads converged upon it. And so you could get to Colossus, Galatia, Laodicea, Sardis, as well as Babylon, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, and you could even get to Europe from Ephesus. And so it's not surprising to know that Ephesus became well known in that day as the market of Asia. It was a great place to do business. It was a thriving business center. This was a world-class city with a great church within its borders. Listen to just some of the amazing leaders that, ha that, that they had at this church. The Apostle Paul actually started this church and ministered there for three years. Priscilla and Aquila helped to nurture this church and grow it. Timothy, one of Paul's disciples and kind of his protege, he pastored the church. And then the Apostle Paul, who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and this book that we're reading, the book of Revelation, he was a pastor there. Tradition also tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a part of this church at Ephesus, which makes a lot of sense since Jesus had asked John to care for his mother, and if John was pastoring there, he would have been with her. And so can you imagine, I mean, this long list of patriarchs and matriarchs of the Christian faith all there at the church in Ephesus. I mean, I can just imagine the things that they saw and heard. I can just imagine them maybe having a parenting conference and having Mary speak on how to raise the perfect child. She's like the only one who's ever done it, right? And so this was a church with a rich history. And it should matter who they are, right? It should matter. I mean, what could go wrong with this church? It was so successful. And yet Jesus speaks to this church specifically at Ephesus. And he points out some, some great aspects of the church. Like we said, there's, there's some commendations. But there's more to it. Let's look at verses 2 and 3 and start with these commendations. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. You've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. You've persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. He's saying, these are some great things that are going on in your church. Several years ago, my, my home church in Painesville, Ohio, near Cleveland, went through a church split. And I hate church splits. I think it breaks God's heart to see a church break up like that. Typically, each side of the split thinks that they're right, <laughs> when, when most of the time they're, they're both wrong in a lot of ways. They're right on some things and wrong on other things, and they just, for some reason, can't get along, and it, it, it's just a horrible situation. 
So three weeks after this church split, they asked me to come in and preach. And I was like, what can I say to this church who's just kind of gone through this stuff, you know? And so I prayed about it, and I, and I, I, I felt like I was led to, to preach a, about this church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And so before I read this scripture to the congregation, I asked them, I said, if Jesus were to come to your church, to come to this church and commend this church for what you're doing right, what do you think he would say? And then I had them answer out loud, and, I, and I'm not joking, it, it sounded exactly what, like what I just read about the church at Ephesus. It was like they were saying, like, we're hardworking. We persevere through hardships. We're faithful. We don't put up with false teachings. And those are great things. But I had suspected that this church at Ephesus and my home church had maybe some of the same issues. They both had these rich histories, great leadership there. And I suspected that they had these issues because it's an issue that plagues many individual churches and individual Christians. And there's usually a good dose of this issue that we're about to read about injected into every church split. So after Jesus commends this church for all the good things that they're doing, after he compliments them, he then changes gears with a very convicting line that will rock this church, the people of this church, to their very core. He moves from commending to condemning. And he says in verse 4, he says, Yet I hold this against you. This is what you're doing wrong. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Other translations say, you've forgotten your first love. And so he commends them and then he condemns them with this. And then he moves right into the correction. Here's what you got to do to get right. Verse 5, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. In other words, you were a great church, but something has changed. You've forgotten the one who is the head of the church. Jesus should be your first love, your Lord, your top priority. I love the song that we just sang a little bit ago. Arian did an incredible job with that. He, he, he has to be first in everything. And he was for the people of this church for a time. But other things had crowded Jesus out of that top spot. And so they had forsaken their first love. Now, to me, it doesn't sound like this church did it intentionally. It's not like they purposely forgot about Jesus, forsook him. It just sounds like maybe they got caught up in, in other things and kind of put Christ to the back burner. They were doing the work of the church, keeping up with sound doctrine, being hardworking. But they forgot about the most important thing. They forgot why they did what they did or for whom they were doing these things, right? They were just kind of going through the motions. You guys know about the, the, that temple, the Taj Mahal in India. The Taj Mahal was intended to be uh, built as a memorial for one of the emperor Shah Jahan's wives. It was his, one of his favorite wives. And after she died, he had this amazing building built, this temple built for her. But after a while, the construction of the Taj Mahal, it consumed Shah Jahan. And while it was still being built, Shah Jahan was walking through the building site, inspecting everything, and he tripped over a box. And he got so angry about this box being in his way that he immediately ordered his servants to get that box out of here and throw it away. Come to find out, that box ended up being the body of his dead wife, the one in which they were building the Taj Mahal. You see, the one whom the building was intended to be built ended up being forgotten. And that's what's happened here at the church in Ephesus. They became so involved in the work of the Lord that they forgot the Lord of the work. And so Jesus looks at this church in Ephesus just like he looks at our church. Then he sees more than just the size of the auditorium and, and the, the amount in the offering and the number of people in the, the, the chairs he looks at more than just that or how nice the building is or how excellent the music is. He looks beyond all of that to the heart of the church. But in order to look at the heart of the church, he has to look at the heart of the believers, the heart of each individual. And that's what I want us to do today. I want us to do a little bit of self-examination and where our, examine where our heart is today. Jesus says, I want total commitment. I want your whole heart, everything about you. I want to be number one. I want to be first. Can you imagine if I went up to my wife and I, and I said to her, Sarah, when it comes to women, you are in my top five. 
You think that'd go over well? <laughs> like next time you see me, I've had, I'd have like two black eyes and an ice pack over my crotch, right? Because uh, it wouldn't go over very well. Because being number three or even number two, it doesn't cut it in a relationship that is totally based on commitment, 100%. And so Jesus goes on in verse five. He says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, you're no longer going to be a church. I'm going to remove your influence. You know, we're told to be a light in the world, a light to the darkness, and, and, and he's going to burn out our light. No more influence. And then he gives one more kind of bit of encouragement, another commendation to this church. Verse 6, he says, But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He's kind of reiterating this good quality that they, they won't put up with wickedness specifically the practices of a group called the Nicolaitans. But then he closes his letter by saying to them, and you'll hear this repeated throughout the letters, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You're going to hear that, I think, all seven times. Then he says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so Jesus, in the last book of the Bible, is going to bring it back to the first book of the Bible with this tree of life uh, analogy here. And so he's saying, if you repent, you're going to be victorious. You, you'll get to eat from the tree of life, meaning you will have everlasting, eternal life. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am going to keep my word from the very beginning. I am trustworthy. It doesn't matter who you are, but it matters who I am. Here's the second phrase for you today. It doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what you have. Doesn't matter what you have. Now, most of us wouldn't admit this out loud, but deep down, a lot of us think in our hearts that it all comes back to what we have, what we possess. And so the last church that Jesus addresses out of these seven churches is the church in a city called Laodicea. And again, we need to understand the context of, of what's going on in this city. Laodicea was a very, very wealthy city, a very medi medically advanced city. It was the wealthiest of the seven churches Jesus addresses. But see, Jesus wasn't impressed by their wealth. Not at all. Again, I told you there's a pattern of three C's to each letter. There's the commendation, the condemnation, and the correction. But this letter to the church at Laodicea is slightly different. Jesus skips right over the commendation. He doesn't tell them anything that they're doing good. He goes right into the condemnation, what they're doing wrong. So again, let's get some context here. The city of Laodicea was strategically located where three major highways were coming together. So it was very highly commercial, bringing in, again, a lot of business. Very, kind of mirrors a little bit with Ephesus. It was well known for its banking industry, and they were known for their fashion industry, which sounds kind of strange, but they were known for the manufacturing of black wool for clothing and woolen carpets. They had an elite medical school, and it, it produced an eye ointment from pulverized rock in that area. Now, that doesn't sound very appealing to me to put pulverized rock in my eye, but apparently this eye ointment uh, was pretty effective. They were known for their advancements in technology. Uh, the wealth in the city was just so great that they built these huge theaters, a huge stadium, lavish public baths. Uh, they had this great shopping, these great shopping centers there. It sounds very familiar, right? Doesn't it? It sounds like your typical major city in the United States. But get this. Laodicea was so wealthy that when an earthquake almost entirely leveled their city in 60 AD, uh, its wealthy citizens refused any help from the Ro Roman government in helping rebuild the city. Like the Roman government pledged financial support to help rebuild the city, and the wealthy people of the city were like, mm, thanks but no thanks, we're good, we got this. That's how rich they were. That's how wealthy they were. They were like, we're not going to accept your help, we, we got this. We're fine. If you were a real estate agent in that day, you would have no problem selling Laodicea. It was a great place to live. It was the land of opportunity, right? They were filthy rich. They were completely self-sufficient, and they didn't need anyone's help. And unfortunately, that same mentality had made its way into the church. But of all the amazing things that they had, the one thing that this city lacked, though, and one, again, that they tried to take care of with their vast wealth and their advancements in technology. But what they lacked was a great source of, of clean water. Nearby, there was a city called Hierapolis, and it was known to have these hot springs. 
They were, they were incredible. They were famous for it. A nearby city called Colossus had cold streams, great for drinking water. Yet Laodicea didn't have it. They didn't have any of that type of water. They had the river Lycus, but it would dry up in the summer. And so they didn't have a good source of, of water. And so since, since the river Lycus would dry up, and they were advanced in technology. What they did is they built this huge system of viaducts. And they would use this, these viaducts to bring in the hot spring waters from Heropolis and the cold stre- streams from uh, Colossus. Yet advanced, as advanced as this technology was for that day, the result was still that the water ended up being tepid, lukewarm, impure at times, and sometimes foul-smelling. There, there were occasions where people would get sick from drinking this water. And so what Jesus is going to say in in his direct message to this church at Laodicea is going to talk about these things that they would have taken pride in. That they would have thought, this is is us, We're, we're known for this, right? We have all this stuff. And so I want you to keep these things in mind as we read this letter, starting in Revelation 3, 14. Flip over there if you have your Bible. It says this. Jesus is speaking again. He says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Pretty harsh words, doesn't he? Doesn't he say here? But do you see the reference here to their water system? Now, I have to admit, when I was a teenager and I read this verse, and I, I think I was taught this. This is maybe why this was in my head. Uh, but it, I, I, you can kind of read it this way. Uh, when he tells the people, I, I kind of thought something that wasn't quite accurate. When he tells the people that they're neither hot nor cold, I wish you were one or the other, instead I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, uh, he, you know, instead of being lukewarm, I got the impression that Jesus would rather us be either hot like on fire for him, passionate for him, or cold, like totally disregard him, not have anything to do with him, rather than be lukewarm. That's really not what he's saying here, though, because hot and cold were actually both good things in this passage. The hot springs were great. The cold streams were great. It was, it was a lukewarm that was nasty, right? But but he also isn't saying that I'd rather you just totally disregard me than be lukewarm. He's saying, I want you fully committed to me rather than lukewarm. Jesus is saying that the condition of their heart is actually making him sick. The passage we read says he wants to spit us out of his mouth. Now that's kind of a weak translation. The literal translation is, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. I wonder if the condition of our heart makes Jesus sick. And again, we need to do some self-reflection. In his book, Crazy Love, by author Francis Chan, he gives a very lengthy profile of what it looks like to be lukewarm. Now, I don't have time to read all of these, but if you ever get a chance, it's a great book to read. Again, uh, Crazy Love by Francis Chan. But here are some of the qualities that Francis Chan uses to help us self-identify if we're lukewarm. And what I want you to do as I read this is I I want you to reflect on these statements and see if some of this description might just fit you. So here are some of them, he says. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly. It's what's expected of them, what they believe good Christians do, so they go. Lukewarm people give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expected of all believers, all of his followers. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, coworkers, or friends. Lukewarm people gauge their morality or their goodness by comparing themselves to the secular world. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus, and he is indeed a part of their lives, but only a part. He isn't allowed to control their lives. Lukewarm people think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. Lukewarm people do whatever is necessary to keep themselves from feeling guilty. Lukewarm people are continually concerned with playing it safe. They are slaves to the God of control. Lukewarm people feel secure because they attend church, made a profession of faith at age 12, were baptized, come from a Christian family, vote Republican, or live in America. 
Lukewarm people do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so that they never have to. And lukewarm people probably drink and swear less than the average, but besides that, they really aren't very different from your typical unbeliever. Any of these stick out to you? Any of these you relate to? Any of these you feel like, man, that sounds like me. And so here's what Jesus says to this church, and maybe he should be saying this to some of us today. He says, you say I'm rich. You people of Laodicea, are you rich? You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus knew the condition of the heart at Laodicea. Not only were they wretched and miserable because they were lukewarm, but notice again what Jesus says about the condition of, uh, in the latter part of this verse in 17. He said that they are poor, blind, and naked. Jesus, in, in pointing out their areas of misery, contrasts all of the riches of this city, doesn't he? He calls them poor. Yes, these these people had plenty of money there, again, known for their banking industry, yet they were spiritually poor. He calls them blind. The city was known for this eye ointment, yet all of the eye ointment in this world couldn't cure their spiritual blindness. He calls them naked. Again, they're known for this fine black wool, but all of the wool in the world couldn't clothe the spiritual nakedness that has existed in their lives. And so in verse 18, Jesus counsels them to buy from him gold refined in the fire. That's where their true riches would come from, from him, not from their possessions. He counsels them to buy from him white clothes to wear. If you remember what white uh, represented, it represented purity. And it's in direct contrast here to the black wool that they would have uh, been making. And so uh, he counsels them to get this white clothes so that they can cover their shameful and spiritually naked bodies. He counsels them to buy salve from him to put on their eyes so that they they could see the true condition of themselves. Their eyes would be opened to their spiritual blindness. And I'm sure that there were those in the church who literally thought that they could buy this stuff from him with their vast amount of wealth. But of course, Jesus was speaking uh, symbolically here. He was speaking of them being dependent on him, not on what they have. Scholar Mark Moore suggests that all of the churches Jesus addresses, of all of these churches, our American churches look more like Laodicea than any of the other six. And that's sad because this is the only church of those seven where Jesus had nothing good to say. Much of the comparison that we can have with that church comes down to the fact that we have a lot of stuff too, don't we? We are rich. We we won't say it. We won't say that out loud. But if we compared ourselves to the rest of the world, we are rich. And so Moore writes, we have money coming out of our ears. It's not, of course, a sin to, to have money. It is a sin to love money. It is a sin to trust money. The problem with trusting in money is that it is so deceptive. Listen to this. It's so deceptive because you're you're comfortable the entire time. You're comfortable the entire time you're doing it without ever realizing how far from God you really are. It's like you didn't even see it coming. Finally, one day you look to see Jesus and you can't see him because he's so far away. You're like, how did this happen? And so in a strange way, in their hearts, the church at Laodicea started to mirror their own water system. They looked impressive, but the more they traveled the streets in their city, the more they became like the people in their city, the more they became like their water, lukewarm and sickening. And so it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you have, and finally, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus has some harsh words for the church at Ephesus and the church at Laodicea, but these are not uncompassionate words that he gives them, that he relays to these churches. Listen to what he says in, in chapter 3, verse 19. He says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I'm doing this out of love. You've got to hear these words because they come from a heart of love. So be earnest and repent. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That's pretty incredible. That is an invitation from Jesus himself. 
I love the story of the preacher who was out making calls one day, out visiting some people, and he drove by a house of one of his older members who didn't get a lot of visitors, and so he thought, well, I'll just stop by and, and check in, in on her and, and see how she's doing. Looks like she's home, and so he saw a car in the driveway, and the, the door was open, but the screen door was shut, and so he went up and he knocked on the door, and there was no answer. And so he knocked again, and there was still no answer, but he could hear the, hear the TV, so he, he knew that she was nearby. But finally, after the third knock with no reply, he, uh, he thought he'd be silly, and so he pulled out a little, his business card, and he wrote on it as kind of a joke, Revelation 3.20, and tucked it into the door. And of course, that's what we just read. Revelation 3.20 is the one where it says, here I am, it's, I stand at the door and knock, since he was standing at the door and knocking. Well, by the following Sunday, he hadn't heard from this, this woman, but she showed up at church and she walked past the preacher. And as she was walking past, she handed him his business card back, the one that had Revelation 3.20 on it, but it had been crossed off. Revelation 3.20 had been crossed out. And instead, she had written Genesis 3.10. And he thought, Genesis 3.10, what, what does that say? And so later that day, he looked it up and it said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. <laughs> Sorry, that had nothing to do with this. But anyway, <laughs> when Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me, that has incredible significance. It's incredible significance because Jesus is inviting us to be in a relationship with him. The God of this universe, the one who's, who's made everything that we see and hear, and touch, and feel, and smell everything that we have, and knows everything, is standing at the door of our hearts and inviting us into relationship with him. That should be awe-inspiring. That should be amazing to us. That should be humbling, shouldn't it? And so Jesus finishes with these words. He says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you listening today? This is what he's saying to us. And so here's what I want to do as we close out today. I want you to imagine that you, uh, your, your life, your walk with Christ is a representation of our entire church. And so if Jesus were to say to you a message of what we need to work on as a church based upon your own life, what would he say to you? So I want us to spend some time thinking about that. Asking him, what would you say to me? How's my heart? Would he say, you've forsaken your first love? Where have you been? Would he say, you've grown lukewarm? You used to be so committed to me. What's happened? Maybe he would say, you need to make a commitment to me for the first time. And today's the day. What's holding you back? So what I want us to do is we're just going to sit in silence. I want us to take a few moments to talk to God and listen to what he would have to say to you. And then I'm going to pray uh, before we sing our last song. So let's do that. Let's listen to what the Spirit has to say to us. Father, these words to the church at Ephesus and Laodicea are very convicting because many times we can be like this as well. We don't do it intentionally, we don't do it purposely, but sometimes we allow things or what we've done or our history or where we've been 
cloud our judgment and get in the way of us totally committing to you and pursuing you. Without even realizing it, we turn and realize that you're not number one anymore. You've moved down our list of priorities. Maybe you're two or three or maybe we're even having a hard time knowing where you are because we've drifted so far. And your words to the church that Ephesus and Laodicea are basically the same. Repent. Turn back to me. Come back to our first love. Recognize our heart condition. Say, I don't want to be there anymore. I want you. I want you to remain Lord of my life. I want to follow you with everything I have. No more holding back. So God, I pray that we would examine our hearts today and know what you're saying to us as we listen to you. God, help us not to grow distant, complacent. Help us not to grow arrogant or just apathetic to you. Help us to continue to seek you in everything that we do or go back to seeking you in everything we do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So he said, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter where you've been because whether you are a Christian who has grown complacent and arrogant or whether you've never opened the door to Jesus before, he's knocking on the, on the door. That invitation is open to each and every one of us. And if you let him in, he welcomes you to the table. He wants to sit down and eat with you. Isn't that an amazing analogy there? What do we do when we sit down and eat with someone? We, we get to know them. We learn about them. We understand them. He's inviting us into relationship with him. And so that invitation is open to you today. So if you have a response to Jesus today, I'm going to be up here to you right as we sing this last song. Will you stand and sing with us?